Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, I would like to solve a couple of problems, actually four problems, um, related to measurements uh, of the heat and comparison to um, whatever other knowledge about physics we have between the heat and the energy and how it's measured, etc. Now, these are very simple problems. And uh, this is basically a continuation of this chapter related to measuring heat, which is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on unizor.com. This is the, the website where it's uh, presented. Um, now, this is the course, which means if you have found this lecture somewhere separately, like on YouTube, for instance, um, I just want you to know that this is uh, just one of many lectures which are related in to each other uh, and they're put into some uh, logical order as a course so basically you have to really um, start from the beginning because there is definitely a dependency and uh, on Unizor not only you have references to these videos but also the textual material for each lecture um, which is basically like a textbook uh, you also have certain problems, you have exams for those who want to challenge themselves. Mm, the site is completely free, there are no advertisement at all, no financial strings attached. Um, and uh, you don't even have to sign in if you don't want to. Uh, but uh, if you do, it will enable you to, to study the course with a supervision. Which means that somebody like a teacher or a parent gives you an assignment, you do the assignment, you do the test, you have the results, and then you basically uh, continue going under this supervision after you successfully pass exam, of course. Okay, so problems on um, heat and its measurement. Okay, first problem is extremely easy. You have, uh, let's say, one liter of water which is one kilogram in mass so liter is a volume of water and we are assuming this is a pure water under good condition it's one kilogram okay so one kilogram of water and you would like to heat it up from 20 degree Celsius to boiling point 100 Celsius question is how much heat do you need for this? Well, by the way, in calories it's very easy because we know that to heat um, uh, one uh, kilogram of uh, one gram of water to heat by one uh, degree is one calorie. One kilogram is one kilocalorie. You have 80 uh, degrees to heat from 20 to 100, so it's 80 um, kilocalories, but I would like actually to uh, to use the uh, system uh, which is basically always used in physics, which is uh, C, System Internationale, and the amount of energy, and heat is an energy, so its amount of heat will be measured in joules. Now for this we have to really know something which is called uh, specific heat capacity um, of uh, of the water because if we know this specific heat capacity then we can basically do the proper multiplication it's just one algebraic operation of multiplication and we will get the answer so again specific heat capacity uh, uh, expressed in uh, units of C so what is it let me just repeat it it's amount of energy needed in joules needed to heat up unit of mass by one degree of Celsius or Kelvin doesn't really matter I mean usually in physics we are using Kelvin's degree but since one degree of Celsius is equal to one degree of Kelvin uh, that's the same thing the unit of measurement is the same. So this is the unit in which we are measuring um, specific heat capacity of any substance. In case of water, it's 400, 180, I think 4 or 
4183 depends. It, it's just a matter of precision and matter of uh, purity of the water, etc. Consider everything is approximate in this case. So I will assume that this is exactly um, the specific heat capacity. So I need 4184 joules to heat one kilogram of water by one degree of Celsius. Celsius. Now we have to uh, uh, heat up one kilogram of water, so we have to multiply by one kilogram and we have to heat it up by the difference between these two 100 minus 20 which is so one is one, so this is 80, so it's 80 times 4000 whatever and the result is Three, three, four, seven, twenty joules, right? Kilogram, uh, Celsius. This is denominator. This is numerator. So we have only joules which remain. So this is amount of heat necessary to heat up the water from 20 to 100, if it's a one kilogram of water. That's very simple problem. All we needed basically is this number. And this number is given as part of the um, condition of this problem. Okay, next. Okay, now, assume the following experiment. We have certain amount of, let's say, water, some kind of a liquid. And um, we know about this uh, water, everything, whatever is needed, which means it's mass, um, it's temperature, and specific heat capacity. So this is the reservoir of this amount of water which is kept under this temperature and we know about water, what's its specific uh, heat capacity. Now, now we have certain, um, let's say, a piece of metal, all right? Now, we know about its mass and we know about its temperature. But we have no idea about what its heat capacity. Now, let's assume that we do have a table of heat capacity of each particular metal. And we don't know what kind of a metal we are, de we are dealing with. So maybe if we can determine the heat capacity, I'll just check it against some table and, then th and that's how I can identify my my metal because obviously different metals have different heat capacities so whatever matches that's my metal so how can i determine the heat capacity of this okay so let's make this experiment we have this amount of water under this temperature with this specific heat uh, capacity now i have this piece of metal i know what its temperature etc so well what i will do I will put this piece of metal into the water. Now let's just assume that metal is not too hot, so water doesn't really boil and evaporate, and it's not too cold, so water doesn't really freeze. So water will just change its temperature. So let's assume that the water is somewhere around room temperature, more or less, and uh, so we know this temperature. And this one may be a little bit hotter, but not, a much, not, not by much. So we don't really have any kind of boiling or whatever. So no change of state of matter, right? So what happens? Well, if this is a little more than this, the temperature a little, uh, this is warmer than this one. Well, eventually, because of all these processes which are happening, 
uh, we will achieve um, thermodynamic equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium means that both the water and the metal will come to the same temperature. Water will be heated a little bit, metal will be cooled down a little bit, and the temperature will be the same, and then we measure this temperature. And this is T. That's actually sufficient amount of information to determine heat capacity. And here is why. Whatever uh, amount of heat metal gave to the water, water has obtained from the metal. Now, knowing the difference between beginning temperature and the ending temperature of the water and its heat capacity and mass, we can determine how much heat water has consumed. It's multiplication of heat capacity times mass of the water times different difference in temperature. Now, it's exactly the same amount of heat which uh, this particular uh, piece of metal gave to the water, right? Now, T is, we, we have just assumed that the metal is uh, warmer than the water, so uh, final temperature is definitely greater. So, whatever, um, I, I can write it in two different ways. I can write it as a sum plus um, capacity of the metal times mass of the metal times uh, difference between temperature ending temperature and beginning temperature. And this is supposed to be equal to zero, right? Because whenever I'm giving away heat, it's with one sign, let's say it's plus. And whenever I'm getting, it's another sign, obviously an opposite sign, which is minus. So, because it's just amount of heat going, going from one to another. One is giving, another is receiving, or vice versa. So basically this is the main equation. Or, I can write it basically slightly differently, knowing what exactly is positive and what is negative, so I can put this is equal to and change the sign here. This is exactly the same thing, right? So from the original one I'll just change the position of one of the members and change the sign, same thing. Now T is greater than TW because the final temperature is of the water is greater than its beginning temperature, but the final temperature of the um, metal is less than the original temperature. So this is positive and this is positive. So this is basically enough to determine this, because everything else we know. So what is this capacity of the metal? Well, it's this times this times this so knowing capacity uh, specific heat capacity of the water knowing masses of the water and the metal and knowing initial and final temperature of um, components of this experiment we can determine what's my uh, specific heat capacity for the piece of metal and that's how for instance we can determine what kind of a metal this is all right so this is my second problem again very simple it's basically solved in one algebraic equation you have the amount of heat which is given you have amount of heat which is received either you combine them together with proper signs or you change the sign and put the equal sign between them, doesn't really matter. But this is just one little equation from which everything can be obtained. By the way, from the same equation, we can do different things. For instance, we don't know the mass, but we do know what kind of a metal this is and what's the specific heat capacity of the metal. Well, then, how th this is the way how we can determine the mass, if you want to, because it can be resolved from for, for for the mass of the metal. So anyway, whatever uh, unknown, if, if there is one unknown 
then from this equation we can basically get this value knowing all, all others. So we can have the mass unknown, we can have um, uh, this unknown, we can have the final temperature unknown, for instance, because it can be resolved for T. So whatever it is, we can always find it out. All right. And by the way, I'll probably do something like exams for this uh, chapter of the course, and in the exams I'll probably put some problems like this, resolving this relative to different um, components. Now, next one. Next one, we will consider a burger. Now, I don't know how it's done. However, food companies put specific uh, amount of calories uh, into each product, whatever they're making. So, I read somewhere that the burger has 300 big calories, which means basically kilocalories in physical terms. Okay, so this is amount of energy in this particular burger. My question is, knowing certain things which I will talk about, I would like to determine if I have eaten a burger, how much energy I have to spend in terms of climbing the stairs, how, how many floors I have to climb up to basically spend this energy. That's my problem. Because, you know, people are exercising and they have to know how much they have to exercise to burn this amount of calories. Well, let's just calculate it using certain information which I will just provide you. So, first of all, let's consider that we are talking about the person whose mass is 75 kilograms, which is kind of an average. Now, we also um, talk about um, climbing uh, the, fl uh, uh, the flights, and uh, let's say between the floors I have 3 meters distance from the first to the second 3 meters, from the second to the third 3 meters, etc. Whatever number of steps. I mean, usually it's like 12 or 14 steps, or I don't know, whatever. 15 steps. Whatever number of steps, I just assume that this is a difference in height between the floors. So this is how much I have to really climb. Now question is, how much, how many floors I have to climb up? I would like to also um, introduce another um, important component into this problem. You see, whenever I'm climbing, I'm not only spending the energy of these burgers to climb the steps. I'm also maintaining basically my, my body, because the body is functioning and not only my, my legs are working. So the whole body is functioning and for this we need energy, because we are eating to maintain the energy needed for our body to exist. Now, only certain amount of this energy is spent towards real climbing. The rest is spent to maintain our existence, to maintain body in, the, in, in a living condition. So let's assume that only 25% of these um, calories we are using to climb the steps. The rest is basically um, maintaining our, our life. Now, okay, now that's enough actually. That's enough information to, to calculate um, the number of steps, number of floors which we have to climb. Well, first of all, let's find out in the same uh, system of units, in joules basically, how much energy is here. So, we know that one kilocalorie is equal to 4, 1, 80, 83 or 84 I took, 84 joules. So, I can find out basically from this how much energy is in my 300. So, 300 kilocalories is 300 times 4, 184, which is equal to 1, 2, 5, 5, 
200 jobs. So that's amount of energy in one burger, right? Seems to be a big number, by the way. Now, I can spend only 25% of this to climb the floors, right? So I have to multiply this by 0.25, which gives me 313800 joules. So this is amount of energy I have to spend climbing. Okay, now, let's count how much energy needed to climb, let's say, one floor. Now, I have the mass, but if I have the mass, I have the gravity, because I'm going against the gravity, right? So my force, which is directed upwards, should be equal to my weight, actually, which is 75 kilogram times 9.8 meters second square, which is acceleration of the free fall. M times A, or G actually in this case, M times G, that's my weight. This is the force which uh, Earth attracts the body. And now, since I know the force, I have to multiply by distance to get the work which is needed, right? So I have to multiply by 3 meters, and it's equal to amount of uh, Newton meters, which is joules, and the answer is 2205 joules. So that's how much energy I need to climb one floor. And this is the amount of energy which I have to spend. So how much, uh, how many floors should I climb if I have this amount of energy and one floor um, requires this much? Well, you have to divide this by this and the result will be approximately 142 floors. Could you imagine 142 floors? That's higher than uh, any building in the United States. Uh, I think the highest building is around 100 floors, more or less. So it's higher than, uh, than the tower in Chicago, than the World uh, Trade Center in New York. That's a lot. And that's for one burger only. So, numbers, by the way, are relatively, I would say, reasonable numbers, including the 25% and including 300. So, amount of food which we are eating is really very rich in energy, because we know how to extract this energy properly. And, well, basically, um, we have to be very careful <laughs> with eating. Because it's not easy to spend so much energy. You have, you have to really climb, like for one burger, if you, if you have extra one, one burger, you have to really climb 142 floors to get rid of it. That's not easy. So, well, be careful with, with your food. Next problem. Next problem is about melting ice. Now, this problem is different from the previous ones because we will also talk about change of the uh, state of the matter from solid ice to liquid water. So here is the problem. Let's say you have 100 gram, 0.1 kilogram of ice at temperature minus 10 degree Celsius. Minus 10, which means it's frozen, right? It's frozen to a temperature minus 10. Now, my question is, how much water, minimum amount of water you need to melt um, this ice 
if the water which you take is of room temperature so you need certain amount of room temperature to uh, convert this amount of ice let's say you, you you take this amount of ice 100 gram and put it in reservoir I mean if reservoir is is large enough and it's 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 of a uh, room temperature obviously the ice will will melt question is what's the minimum amount of water in this reservoir under this temperature to melt completely ice because if it's just a small amount of water well part of the ice might actually temporarily um, melt and then the rest will probably freeze this amount of water and it will be still kind of a um, uh, it, it will be still ice but maybe with slightly less temperature like minus nine but it will be still ice but I need the, I have to bring temperature of the ice down to zero that's the melting point so I have to bring it down to zero and by the way zero is very specific number zero of Celsius is when the water is water and the ice is ice and both can have this zero temperature and there is a special amount of extra energy which is needed to convert from ice to water uh, or if you want to, to freeze the water then the water should actually be um, the energy should be taken from the water so either the water will receive the energy um, I mean ice will receive the energy to, to, to be converted into into water under the same temperature of zero degrees or the water should be taken certain amount of heat if it's already under zero but it's supposed to be uh, converted into ice you have to take some amount of water uh, of energy all right so in this particular case we are melting ice which means we have to bring temperature down to zero while ice is still ice with its own specific heat capacity. Now, what's the specific heat capacity of the ice? It's 2090 joules per kilogram degree degree of Celsius. And specific water heat is 4180 I put, I think, in this case, 43. Sometimes I put 41, 83, sometimes 84. It's all approximation, so it depends on the... Uh, in the same units. Uh, joules by kilogram and degree of Celsius. So, my water, whatever the, whatever the amount of water I have, let's say I have M, should be used under this temperature it should be used to heat up the ice first by 10 degrees from minus 10 to 0 and it's still ice and then to melt it and again this is a completely different uh, amount of energy if ice is already under zero uh, temperature degree and you want to convert it into water under the same zero uh, degrees Celsius you still have to spend certain amount of heat and this is a known uh, amount it's a melting amount and uh, of energy and it's measured in uh, joules per kilogram right so the melting point amount of heat uh, for the melting point is equal to uh, 333 three zero 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 joules per kilogram so that's how much energy you need to melt one kilogram at zero degrees Celsius of ice into zero degrees of Celsius water so just to change the state from ice to water you need that much energy now this energy also should be contained in our mass of water so what's the total amount of energy which i have to have to convert this ice into the water at zero degrees well first i have to have sea ice times one kilogram of mass times number of degrees which is from zero 
I have to subtract minus 10 so it's plus so that's my amount of energy so it's 2090 basically times 10 so it's 2090 10 right that's amount of heat joules that's how much I have to spend now this is only part of the problem now the next part of the problem is I have to spend this amount of energy now my ice is at zero degrees uh, Celsius but this is still ice I need to convert it into water it's still one kilogram of ice I would like to convert it into one kilogram of water without changing the temperature just to convert from one state from the solid state into the liquid so I have to add this amount to this so it will be three 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 thousand plus twenty ninety and that would be three five three nine zero zero joules that's how much energy I need to first warm up the ice to zero and then to convert it from uh, ice at zero to water at zero degrees all this energy must be released by the water which is initially at 20 degrees and it has certain mass which I don't know I would like to actually find out so what's the minimum amount is when my sea water the specific heat capacity of the water times its mass times um, what's the difference in degrees water will be brought into zero as well we are all we are bringing ice to, to zero and, and the water to zero which is melting ice so that would be zero, 20, uh, 0 minus 20 so it will be 20 degrees um, obviously this will be with a minus sign because it's 0 minus 20 so minus this one plus this one should be equal to zero so if I would like to find out really my M now sea water I know what it is it's 4 1 H is 3 so if I'm equating this to this I will have my mass equals to uh, okay I didn't really calculate it but you can calculate it yourself uh, I put it into a uh, textual description so that would be the answer it's uh, uh, 4 1 sorry it would be 3 5 3 9 hundred divided by 4 1 h is 3 times 20 so that's what it is so that's amount of water needed okay Uh, I think I made a little mistake here. It's 0 0.1 kilogram. So it's this. So it's this and it's different. It's 3, 3, 5. something like this right so three five zero nine three three five zero nine zero. so whatever it is this is the amount of water at 20 degrees which I need to melt my 100 grams of ice well um, uh, that's it. These are my very simple uh, problems uh, and uh, next probably I will spend some time and I will prepare the exams for uh, this particular topic and similar problems will be uh, part of the exams. I do encourage you first of all to go to this website and read the text for this lecture uh, and the next after the problems there will be exam and I do encourage you to take exam. That's just another little challenge for you. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. So that's it for today. Thank you.